Okay. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for um, today's workshop for inclusive and safe field work. Um, we're very happy to be able to share this with you. Um, this workshop is hosted by the Ameriflex Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee, um, which is a group of about 20 people from the Ameriflex community. And then six people listed here on this slide have been very involved putting together this workshop. So those are Jeffrey Atkins, myself, Lisa Haber, Andre, Andre Santos, Alex Wallach, and Kung Yi. And I'm happy to tease a special performance by the Virginia Commonwealth University Goff Lab. Um, you might not have heard about the Ameriflex DEI Committee we launched just last year. As I said, we have 20 members, um, new people always welcome. And so far we have worked on a number of initiatives that are selected by the members of the committee. Um, you might have noticed that Ameriflex meetings have lately adopted a code of conduct. Um, we've also started tracking demographic data for Ameriflex events. Um, we did send around a DEI and workplace climate survey last year that we are still um, analyzing in more detail. Uh, we also hosted a panel discussion on awareness and action for inclusive field work. And um, we have developed this resource over the last couple of months um, for inclusive and safe field work, and we are rolling this out today. And you can also look forward to a Twitter campaign on inclusive job postings. And you can be among the first people to follow at Ameriflex D to keep in touch with what the DEI committee is up to. And if you have any questions, suggestions, or uh, if you're interested in joining, um, the email address is ameriflex-dei at lbl.gov. So why are we doing this workshop? Um, we think that field work is very central to a lot of um, Ameriflex projects. And it is a very unique time where you can have pretty big physical challenges, long days, um, and at the same time that might coincide with mentally taxing situations. And uh, it's been shown in many, many surveys that discriminating and marginalizing experiences during fieldwork disproportionately uh, are reported by women, minority, LGBTQ and disabled scholars, so they don't affect everyone equally. And so this um, brings up the question whether that may be linked to the fact that geosciences and earth sciences are much less diverse than other STEM disciplines, which is the case for the US. Um, we, I told you that we launched a workplace climate survey last year that we are still looking at in greater detail, but I can tell you that about a third of respondents um, did indicate they did not have a safety protocol for their field work or didn't know whether they had one and that they didn't receive safety training for their field work activities. And um, also 11% told us that they have experienced discrimination based on identity in the field or traveling to the field. And 17% told us that they have observed such discrimination. So the conclusion um, we think we can draw is that these issues um, do not stop at the doors of the Ameriflex community. We are not the exception. And so it's worth spending some time investigating that and thinking about that. And that's what you are here to do. Um, and so we just want to acknowledge uh, and thank you for signing up, for showing up um, and acknowledge that every uh, person and every institution and every group is probably at a different point in this journey to more inclusive and safe field work. And it's really going to depend on what is your institutional culture, what trainings and resources um, do you have available, what guidance from your bigger organization, and what money, uh, what time and money can you devote to making the field work um, more inclusive and safe. And so that's really going to be different for everybody. Um, and everyone is on a different place in that journey, but we are all on the same journey. And so the program for today after this intro is to dive right into our first interactive discussion, which we are not planning to record. Uh, and we have called the scenes from a lab. And then after a break, we are uh, excited to present to you the Ameriflex resource for inclusive and safe field work. Um, and then after that, we again want to form breakout groups 
based on specific fieldwork challenges or different ecosystems, and then really dive into that resource and think about what, um, you know, what, what things you would put on your checklist or into your fieldwork planner for different scenarios. And so the big goals for today, the biggest one is to create that awareness and um, particularly uh, to get us thinking more about that, um, you know, you have these physical challenges, you have these uh, mental and mentally taxing situations. And so it's really kind of thinking together about physical safety and psychological safety that are two things that are really strongly connected and being aware of how they uh, really play together. Um, we also hope that you come away with a lot of guidance and a lot of, um, you know, being pointed in um, a good direction where you can find more information and how to approach um, putting better fieldwork training and uh, safety planning in place for your team. And then we just hope um, that you also come away with some motivation to keep at it because it's not going to be um, a very uh, quick process. So we hope uh, to boost your persistence and that you um, keep trying to make improvements. And so that's the excellent part, uh, the excellence part. Uh, what we cannot do uh, in this workshop is a full hazard assessment for, you know, everyone's field safety situation. Uh, we can't be a replacement for um, appropriate safety training, and we are not a substitute for really talking to the experts and the stakeholders for your unique circumstances. Um, and so unfortunately, I don't think after these two hours, you will um, have a silver bullet for, for everything, but we hope to... Um, to, to get everybody on the way. Um, and so to start that, um, I'm gonna hand it over to Alex to introduce scenes from the lab. Okay, welcome back from the break. Um, and now finally, the big reveal. Uh, we're very excited to share with you the Ameriflex resource for inclusive and safe field work. And as I said before, the challenge here for us, for the DEI committee was that we have so many different institutions and groups that are part of the Ameriflex community that we wanted to create something that is really flexible and can be used in different ways. And um, what we are sharing with you is a slide deck. Uh, you will get um, a Google Slides link. You can make your own copy, adapt it to your own needs or um, a PowerPoint file as well. And it has uh, one slide on the motivation for this, similar to the points I made uh, in the intro to this workshop. Uh, we then have two slides that are just super full and really dense of a list of topics that we think um, should be discussed, should be thought about if you think about inclusive and safe field work. Um, so that is two slides, lots of links. And then we have three templates um, that are in a style of a checklist that you can adapt for your team. And um, one, uh, the first one is before you go for planning your field trip. The second checklist is information you want in the field. And then the third one is uh, things to think about after um, you return from a field trip. And then we um, finish with uh, a list of sort of main bibliography, you know, big places like advanced geo where you can just find so much more information and in the appendix we have a number of examples that you know you could take uh, and make your own after working through these topics that we provide and i'm going to go over some of those examples as well um, so as a super short summary um, because we don't uh, you know we can't go into every detail and every eventuality but the topics we think are really important to um, think about for your inclusive and safe field work the first three are kind of guiding principles for the rest and we think that for everyone the top priority is that all team members get home healthy and safely and uh, at the end of the day, and that we don't, you know, we don't risk our mental health and our physical health for a data set. And then the other priority, whether it's data collection or training students or something else that is, you know, that really, again, depends on your group and your project. Um, as long as everyone gets home healthy, um, that's, that's really the important part. And then number three is also really guiding the rest of these topics is that, you know, it's a good reminder that the field site 
isn't um, a magic fun land. It's a part of the workplace. Um, and we, uh, we all do better if we remember professional behavior and if we make sure everyone has the training they need to do the job. And that kind of plays into the other points. Let's see how oh, I can advance the slide. Okay, um, we have a, a part with some resources on cultivating a culture of respect for um, everyone in our diverse and international community. Everyone deserves respect. And um, it's good to remember that different people come with very different ideas and abilities and they can all contribute, um, but they might uh, have different needs in order to be able to contribute to the best of their ability. And then closely related is to pay attention to psychological safety. And we all know stories and maybe some of those were shared in the breakouts that um, field work can be seen as a rite of passage where it's the time for some, some bullying or hazing um, or general peer pressure. Uh, and that's just um, not making a good experience for everyone. And it's also been shown, and we have, we have some links for you if you want to learn more, that assault and harassment are more frequently experienced by trainees in field work. And that means at the same time that this, this phenomenon might not be so visible to the more senior members that can intervene. Um, and it's worth paying some attention to and, and making sure um, that, you, that you intervene. Then there is the classic about um, hazards in the field work. So you want to understand what the hazards are and then you want to mitigate them as best you can and train everyone to work safely um, and the, the classics are, you know, physical and natural hazards. We have lots and lots of resources in, um, in our slide deck about, you know, things with wildlife, extreme weather, working at heights, of course, on a flex tower, um, or working on a body of water. That's a particular hazard and electrical work. And, you know, there are just so many things that really depend on your site. Um, and a first aid kit, not only do you want to have one, you want to make sure everyone knows where it is how to use it. And it might be that you want to add something to your first aid kit, depending on the hazards that are present in your field site. So that's something to consider. And we also talk more nowadays about the human hazards, um, which not only um, come from group members not getting along, not feeling safely uh, working with each other, but also people from outside your group. Um, and that again is a, an opportunity to put yourself into someone else's shoes where uh, you know a stranger um, at the field site might not be so intimidating to you, but might be very threatening to someone with a different identity, part of a different um, demographic group. And, and that's something to consider really carefully. Um, you want to think about accessibility. Again, this is about just empowering each team member to be able to contribute to the greater mission. Um, and that can be very simple where you can recognize uh, someone might not have been camping ever in their life and, and been really hiking or outdoors that much. And they just need a little bit of information so they can really thrive um, and have a good day and have, uh, have a good experience and contribute to, um, to your work. And then you also want to think about um, colleagues with different abilities, of course, and we have lots and lots of resources linked in our slide deck about um, accommodating people with different physical strength, things like color blindness, deafness, you know, this, this could be, this is not a comprehensive list, of course. And then the last point is again, this mixture of something that's just the right thing to do and also a very practical thing to do is to talk to people. Um, and that includes uh, local peoples, tribes, or um, people living on the land that you work on and that might be impacted or might be, um, unsure about what you are doing. Uh, and so making sure that they know what's going on um, is, is just kind of a matter of respectful um, uh, culture. And then also the practical aspect of um, calling your the nearby fire department before you, your field season and make sure they know how to find you know, your remote field site. That's really hard to describe how to find. Um, that can save you some time in case of an emergency uh, and so that's just a really practical consideration. So those are the big topics. And then on each, each of them, uh, I really condensed down this list for, for this workshop. But then on the slide deck, we have a lot more subpoints and um, a huge amount of links. 
And so then the question is, you know, how do you use this resource? And um, the answer is, it really depends. It, it depends on where you start um, and where you go from, from there. And so you will have to make an assessment of what do I already have in place? Do I understand my hazards? Do I have good training um, for my team uh, members? You know, where does your awareness stand, especially for this kind of interaction that physical and psychological safety are really two sides of the same coin in, in very many situations? Um, how is the accessibility of your field side? Can, can you be more accommodating to people with different abilities? And uh, how about just the general culture of respect and the general safety culture at your institution? And you'll have to um, really figure out where you're starting and then improve from there. But I don't want to be too discouraging uh, or, or make it overwhelming because the, the important message is um, starting today is, you know, the best time to start is today. And if you put a first aid kit in the car today, then that is a great start because it won't, um, it won't be kind of a one and done process. You will have to keep learning keep adapting um, in order to create those good habits for a team culture, it'll have to be a process. Um, and our suggestion would be, um, I'm going to share some examples with you in a second that um, you develop a draft possibly for one of those work products. And then um, very importantly, share and discuss it with the team members and really give people a voice regardless of whether they are very junior or very senior. Um, because that's how you get, you know, these multiple perspectives, and that's how how you make sure um, that a lot of things are covered. And then treat it as a living document that um, should be updated when something changes your tasks or uh, the members of your team, or you learn something. Um, just to, you know, keep it keep it updated. Um, that would be the ideal case. And so for, um, you know think about you you would work through these topics that we have provided read a little bit more about some uh, some aspects that you find relevant and then you could have different products that could come out of um, this resource and so we have three examples um, that i can share now so the first one are the checklists that um, are given as a template in the in the slide deck and a, an example application for that would be that you do mostly routine field trips, you go to the same place, you do similar work, um, and you have team members that mostly know what they're doing. And it's all, you know, it's a well-oiled machine. And in that case, maybe you just need some checklists. And so for planning the trip, you just have this reminder, we have ticks on the field site in summer, or, um, you know, make sure the satellite phone is charged because you know that tends to be forgotten. Uh, and so then you just put that on the checklist and everyone, has, has a um, look through these items when they prepare. And then for in the field, you just mostly have kind of reminders about um, expectation for behavior. And then, you know, maybe that, um, that brief set of instructions, how to describe to someone to find your field site, that could be useful if you do need to call an ambulance or something. And for the, again, for the post fieldwork checklist, it's, um, that would just really be a checklist and um, something you could include here is when someone does have um, an encounter that is unsafe um, or that, you know, th that they felt assaulted or harassed, that you tell them where they can get counseling and that's something that's specific on your institution. A lot of universities provide an option and of course also include where they can make a report um, and just have that information available. And then it can also be very practical. You can say our safety kit needs to have bear spray. Every time we return from the field, make sure it's there. Um, so that could be um, the format of a checklist. The next example we have is a more detailed fieldwork planner. And that might be the right thing if you are planning um, a new kind of fieldwork or if you frequently work with um, new team members, maybe these undergrad volunteers from the video. Um, and so this, um, we also will share the template for this with you. Um, this is a three pager starting with a brief code of conduct and then some um, contact information for emergency services. And then um, it has a bunch of tables that you kind of just go through and fill out what's the plan, um, what are the conditions, and that helps everyone to be on the same page. And we're zooming in on the first one here, the logistics. You know, it's, it's really very straightforward. When do we leave? When do we return? 
let's have a look at the weather. Maybe there are specific hazards that we can um, derive from that. And you know, this information, it's, it's kind of um, very straightforward, but it's exactly what the, the volunteer in the video really needed to, to have a good field experience. That's, that's what they weren't prepared for. So just providing that information might make a really big difference. And then uh, we have a third example. And here, um, the idea is if you are someone who says, well, really, we really um, know about our physical hazards and we have a lot of training for that. And so the physical safety um, is kind of taken care of. And maybe I'm looking for something that's closer to a code of conduct. Um, and so here we are sharing something from a group at UC Berkeley from Ben Blonder who um, just wrote a really well phrased um, code of conduct that every group member has to read and accept before they um, go. And I pulled out two quotes here that I want to highlight. Um, so these expectations include, but are not limited to avoid unwanted sexual advances, unsolicited comments on physical appearance, unnecessary testing of people's physical and emotional limits, hazing traditions, inappropriate jokes, and gender divisions of labor. I acknowledge that research has shown that there is a long history of harassment in scientific fieldwork and that the issue persists with reference. I also acknowledge that victims of discrimination, harassment, and assault in scientific fieldwork often experience long lasting damage to their emotional and physical well being and to their careers. Um, so, again, that's just going into the direction of creating that awareness and keeping things in mind, and my choices affect other people. So those are um, the three examples. Um, you know, you could really use this resource in your own way and create your own product. And that could be a mixture of the three examples as well. And um, now we have, we're exploring one topic in particular and I'm gonna hand it over to Jeff. Uh, sure, thanks. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit more specifically about uh, microaggressions. And you know, kind of a, a basic definition is, is basically like a commonplace daily verbal behavior, environmental slights, you know, whether these are intentional or unintentional things said that tend to communicate like a hostile, you know, even derogatory or negative attitudes towards, you know, specifically stigmatized or culturally marginalized groups. Um, these kind of exist on a spectrum from like straight out aggressive to just kind of rude. So I don't think it's really, we don't need to necessarily get stuck in the hard classification or definition of this. Cause a lot of times we, you, know, you can think of this different ways. Like maybe these are just kind of like these that people say, sometimes it can be described as, you know, death by a thousand paper cuts, constant stream of slights, like things that are said that tend to create, you know, kind of this hostile derogatory work environment. So, you know, we want to think about a little bit about the impact of this and whether it exists on this whole straight, you know, real microaggression, even to just rude comment. But, you know, specifically, these tend to, again, to be directed at members of marginalized groups. They often tend to be rooted in, you know, biases or stereotypes, even ones that we're maybe not even front of mind conscious of. So some of those, you know, kind of hidden biases that we have. But, you know, generally, we think of these, like, they tend to be experienced continuously. Um, and the general rule is that each one of these individual act interactions or kind of comments, they tend to be too minor in and of themselves, right? Like in an isolation, they don't really, you know, kind of think of one thing to stand up. It's more of the, you know, aggregation of these. A lot of times microaggressions tend to be framed as a joke. You hear people say like, oh, I was just joking or you can't take it. Um, they tend to be received through an individual lens based on a marginalizing experience. So, you know, sometimes maybe the person doesn't even realize necessarily why this is a microaggression or why it might even be derogatory. But these interactions, they add up. You know, these psychological load kind of binds attention, it creates this hostile work environment we're talking about. And it kind of creates a situation where not everyone feels comfortable or able to contribute to the best of their abilities. So we put down a bunch of um, examples here. And so I can, I'm glad to let you read through with these because honestly, I would be uncomfortable reading a lot of them out loud, right? Because <laughs> it's just, but these, these tend to be the pretty good examples that we pulled that, you know, kind of give you a sense of the shape of what we're talking about, kind of the universe of this. And if you think about it, you know, these adding up, like you can see how this would create that kind of environment where you would not necessarily 
you know, want to be in or creates that situation where you don't feel welcome. Okay, okay, yeah, okay. So in scenes from a lab, we, um, you know, Kristen put these together, so it's really good. So think about the additive effect of like toxic comments that showed up within, you know, the, the videos that we looked at. Uh, specifically the one that came early on, you won't be of much help around here until you learn the basics. Um, or even things that maybe some people wouldn't think about, like we don't have a bathroom, but there is the forest, right? Like, I mean, there's been some talk about how, you know, maybe those of us who had a lot of outdoor experience growing up, like that was like a really common thing. It's not for everyone, right? And so that can come off as you know, different than maybe people kind of intended. And, you know, we expect undergrads to know what to do when they come out to the field, and I don't know what to tell you. And we think about potential outcomes that come from this, right? Like it can create lack of confidence in one's own abilities and be kind of isolated. It gives the impression that that individual, that their needs are irrelevant, that they don't matter. So they're not going to feel welcome. They're not going to want to contribute or even feel realized as a person. Again, it creates those feelings of isolation, and specifically when they don't have guidance to help bring them into that. And it's going to create distractions that's going to, you know, potentially be further safety hazards, you know, you know, physical safety hazards might generate from this because of the feelings that they have. So the ultimate conclusion is that, you know, field work or research, they might come to that it's not a good fit, you know, specifically in this video for, for Lisa, because of all these kind of accumulation of all these like small comments and small, you know, acts that in themselves, you know, they add up. So is this the one that's pulled from like people's individual comments here? It is. Um, let me see if. Okay, let me just look at the other view. Oh, I see. I'm glad you understand how to operate this because I have no idea. <laughs> okay, being called little lady. Mm. Okay, keep them coming. Do you want to wrap it up, Jeff? No, I, I, I think that's that's kind of a good summation. I think that's what we got. And I think it's, and I'm glad that some people were able to give kind of you know, contributions in their own experience, I think. Um, you know, when we think about marginalized groups and everything, the best we can do is, is to, to kind of be open and to listen and to be receptive of that. And, you know, just think about how we comport ourselves and need to be more open and learning about that. So, yeah, thank you. And I'll pass it back to you. Okay, now we have Kung introducing our breakout activity. Okay, thanks, Kristen. So, yeah, here's another uh, activity we will do this time. So. This is a breakout discussion that will discuss some of the specific challenges under a certain circumstance and we'll discuss how we could adapt uh, the resource to uh, meet those challenges. Uh, so here's what we're going to do. Uh, so this time you will going to uh, select a breakout room manually uh, based on your fieldwork challenges that you are interested in. And in this group, we will work together on adapting the checklist templates for this fieldwork challenge, challenges. And uh, we'll provide a, a discussion prompt uh, in the slide deck so you can, uh, we can have a discussion based on that and we can actually uh, apply, uh, uh, adapt, adapt, adapt some of the discussion on the checklist 